Some of the talks we've been having over the last two or three weeks have all been around the subject of how Jesus trained his group of disciples. And <clears throat> this is really important because when we come to think about how we have done discipleship ourselves in the church, there's sometimes a big mismatch there which we have to challenge ourselves and to think about. And for those of you who haven't been here, when I've been talk I and others have been talking about this previously, um, I'm just going to do a quick summary of uh, the bits that you haven't heard, and then to try and focus on what the reading from Acts that Peter has just brought to us adds to that. We know that Jesus began by calling together a group of 12 men uh, to be with him. I would like to believe that he chose that particular 12 because, or many of them anyway, because they were the most enthusiastic people that he noticed around him when he was beginning to teach and to do miracles amongst the people. Some scholars believe that James and John, for example, were distantly related to Jesus. I can't prove that, but they seem to think so. Uh, so you can see reasons why they may have been there, but these were the keen ones. And so he says to them, right, let's gather together, and he makes them the 12 who are very much at the centre of the work that he's doing. And he begins to take these 12 men with him everywhere, and he asks them to begin looking at what he's doing and to learn from it. And I suggested that uh, what he was doing there was calling together, in effect, a home group, or what we would often call a home group, the right, about the right number of people, and began to pour into them what he knew and what he wanted them to learn. But then there comes a point where <clears throat> the, 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 the looking at the miracles and listening to the teaching all comes to an end. He, he pulls the 12 together, he gives them authority, and he sends them out. And he says, okay, you 12, you've seen me doing these things, you've heard the teaching, now I want you to go and do what you've seen me do. So their discipleship changes gear. It's no longer just being with Jesus, witnessing the things that he does but actually going out to do it themselves. There's a point at which discipleship has to stop becoming a spectator sport and become something which involves us. And it's probably at that point where <clears throat> large tranches of the church, in, certainly in the Western world, has come adrift from what the Bible is trying to teach in that uh, some congregations, not this one, of course, but uh, so some congregations, especially large congregations, tend to be uh, sort of sitting in, in, in rows and in large numbers, just watching what a few people do at the front. And some of these people are extremely gifted indeed, but really it seems that Jesus is looking at something which isn't quite that. Um, yes, there were times when he addressed crowds of possibly thousands of people, but the intention was not just to kind of build himself up as an international conference speaker, as it were. Uh, the intention was that they began to replicate the kind of ministry that he uh, had himself now, at the end of, uh, of Jesus' ministry, the 12 disciples reduces to 11 with the betrayal of Judas. And 
These 11 uh, don't exactly cover themselves with glory at the time of the crucifixion. But they are still together as a group when Jesus rises from the dead. They are, of course, just as amazed as anyone would have been when that happens. And in the 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus appears to them at various times. He has meals with them. He begins to talk to them about the what now after he has died and risen from the dead. And we're told in Acts that he's talking to them about the kingdom of God and about how the kingdom of God is is to come. And uh, we know from... from, uh, from the whole of the New Testament, really, that what he's doing there is changing the the general belief that Jews had, that there would come a time when the day of the Lord would come and God would intervene powerfully in history. Rather, he got that to mean that in the miracles and the, the healings that were done, in the teaching that was being given, um, in the salvation of many hundreds of people. These, all thing, these were all things which were signs of this coming kingdom breaking in to the present age. And there would come a time still in the future when he would, Christ would return, and, which would be the culmination of the age. That the kingdom of God is something which would be coming amongst the disciples in the future. And the 40 days after the resurrection was the time for uh, trying to, 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 to learn that as a kind of framework. And then 40 days after the resurrection, uh, he comes together on the Mount of Olives with the disciples and <clears throat> he spells out to them uh, <clears throat> the very last thing that he ever says to them on earth which is Acts 1 and verse 8. You, the disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So... There's going to be another gear change, as it were, in their discipleship. To begin with, it was just watching what he was doing, sharing that amongst themselves. Then they were actually going out to do it themselves. They were debriefing those times with Jesus, and we find moments in the Gospels where they do that. Now there comes a time when they have to be... uh, praying that the kingdom will come without Jesus there at all in the flesh and looking at a time when they would be ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know what happens. Jesus ascends into heaven. They go back to Jerusalem. They spend the next 10 days praying and getting things in order. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes. And <clears throat> this real gear change takes place. And that these, this group of men who hadn't exactly always covered themselves in glory when they were following Jesus, when he was there in the flesh become the engine room, as it were, of the church. And the church begins to grow and expand, and they become the key members of it. So, what about how that process translates into our own discipleship? Has that been our experience? And I suspect that for for a lot of us, it hasn't actually been that way. You know, we've tended to, uh, to, to, to worship in sort of fairly passive situations. Some of us have never been offered the opportunity to actually do ministry. And as for sort of 
ministry and the power of the Spirit, we might have understood just a little bit about it, but you know, what's that all about? Well, I think we have to ask ourselves several questions, don't we? One is, uh, what have we done about becoming part of a group where that learning can begin to take place? And I I challenged uh, several of the congregations here to think about that. Some of us are members of very formally constituted home groups, Perhaps many of you already are. And some home groups work better than others. You can't demand that sort of chemistry between people always works really well. But many Christians' testimony is that their membership of a small group like that is actually important in helping them to grow as Christians. And that's as it should be. But I suggested that there are other kinds of groups that you can be part of as well. And that particularly in Asia... There are many churches which are built around people that are just in prayer triplets, groups of three people who meet to pray and to be accountable to each other. That's fine. Uh, you know, that, that's just as valid a group as uh, you know, a home group in, in this country. And there are other kinds of groups as well that we can be part of, and many of you are members of such groups. Perhaps we then need to ask ourselves the question of whether we have moved on to the stage of not being spectators anymore. Are we kind of happy with that in a group that's becoming a bit cosy? Or is that group challenging us to do other things in the church, to actually step out ourselves and to be involved in something which involves us in in doing ministry, whatever that means. It could be ministry with children and young people, ministry out in the community, in the food bank, all sorts of other things as well. There's sort of no no limit on that and, and no prescribed rules about how that happens, certainly from the Gospels and Acts. And I, I think that's a challenge that a lot of Anglicans... Uh, sometimes need to pick up and that we are in grave danger sometimes of being the kind of church which reverts to having a lot of people watching the experts at the front do things. And we need to try and move beyond that and to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we are being sent out with the authority of Jesus. But then what about this bit in Acts? where it seems that the real gear change for the first disciples of Jesus is this moment of the ascension and of of Pentecost, when somehow their, their lives are transformed by a very powerful encounter with God the Holy Spirit. And how should this translate? Well, the answer for the, the, the first disciples was that they began to find themselves in a dimension where they were able to do the stuff that Jesus did, even where it involved the supernatural. And that where Jesus was able to move in gifts like the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, in things like healings and in miracles and in prophecy and other gifts too, they found that they were somehow able now to enter into that. Now, that's not actually surprising. Because if the Holy Spirit is God, in the same, almost the same way that Jesus is God, then if God comes to dwell in us by his power, then he must bring, in some way, all of his character and his gifts with him. And... I think that that some Pentecostals have have at times made the mistake of of dividing up these kinds of gifts into little packages and and expecting God to hit them with one or other package so that they've ended up in saying things like, well, if you don't speak in tongues, then you aren't uh, a real spirit-filled Christian which is ludicrous, it seems to me, that that, if you're filled with the Spirit, then actually 
you know, all of God's gifts are somehow access- must be accessible to you because they are there. And, and so, <clears throat> in the same way that Jesus found that, that his ministry became accompanied by supernatural things, like healings, like the casting out of demons, like words of knowledge, and we find all of these things in the ministry of Jesus, and they're easily identifiable. The disciples find that their ministry in the book of Acts is certainly accompanied by these same things. And because their ministry is accompanied by those things, people start turning to Christ. So this is a place which I think we need to go to, but <clears throat> which perhaps we don't go to sometimes because it's a bit scary. You know, supernatural stuff? Hang on a minute. You know, and, and, and yet, you know, we believe in a God who is supernatural, uh, a, a God who supernaturally dwells within us by the Holy Spirit and brings all of this stuff with him. And perhaps <clears throat> the challenge for, for many of our, dis- uh, you know, the discipleship of many of us is to, 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 to kind of move into that gear change so that we too are exhibiting the ministry of Jesus Christ as the disciples were suddenly ushered into at Pentecost. <clears throat> we don't have to go through all of the stages in the way that they did because they were just sort of living it with Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is available to us. And so what they were doing was, <clears throat> as it were, allowing the, the, the ministry of the Spirit to be released in them while they were following the broad strategy that Jesus had outlined to them in, their, in his last words. You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, i.e. right here, um, where you are, in all Judea and Samaria, you know, a bit further out, and then to the ends of the earth. And we see that strategy working out in the book of Acts as the gospel is taken to the entire Roman Empire and to the whole of the known world at that time. So, we need to take, take those things on board. And I, as, as a church leader, need to take that on board too. If I'm kind of holding the lid on the saucepan, as it were, you know, and not allowing all of this stuff to be released in our midst, then uh, I think I'm the one who's going to have to answer to God for all of that. So, at this stage, where, where Jesus ascends into heaven and sends the Spirit on the church, this is also a stage in the discipleship of the church, which in some way needs to be replicated in our midst. Now, I don't know exactly how that's going to happen because I don't think God does things in boring ways kind of over and over and over again. I actually think, you know, it's going to be quite exciting as we find some things out. But of course it does involve all of us in stepping out in faith, sometimes in going to places where we didn't expect to go And actually listening to God in case he wants us to step out into some of this more supernatural stuff, which is actually a lot more risky, but I can promise you is extremely exciting uh, when you see God do.